This is episode 94 of the We Live to Build podcast. Today's guest is Patricia Recarte, a Spanish entrepreneur currently based in New York. She is the CEO and co-founder of Cado Networks, a platform for professionals to develop a centralized knowledge graph of their clients and partners in order to automate and manage their relationships. Before starting Cado Networks, Patty worked with several startups where she helped them raise tens of millions and grow internally. After she felt successful in those endeavors, she knew the next step was to start her own company. In this interview, Patty and I discuss the disconnect between what we expected in running companies and the reality of our experience. How to handle doing everything in the beginning, working remote versus working in an office, and much more. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Patty because I know that I did. Let's begin the show. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever-increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you got into being an entrepreneur, and we'll go from there. I'm Patty. I'm Spanish. I started my company, Caro. It's a networking and relationship management solution for enterprise. So think of a mix between a Salesforce and a LinkedIn. And uh, well, I basically started working in investment banking in London. Back in the days, after three years, I decided that that was enough for me. So I started working in, in different startups. The first startup I worked at was Fever, is an event discovery platform. Actually, they announced yesterday a new fundraising. Actually, they just became a unicorn. Then after that, I went to another startup called 21 Buttons in Fashion Tech, um, where I was head of corporate strategy and and expansion. So, you know, after going through a couple of of startups, at some point I decided that it was my turn, especially because my role in this company had a lot of like relationship building. Um, tied to it and that's sort of like when I started discovering there was a gap in the market especially when I looked at like very traditional sectors like if you think of investment bankers lawyers realtors how they do businesses through relationships and the reality is that these people hate CRMs actually less than five percent of lawyers in the states actually use a CRM which is an interesting data point and it's because CRMs are very focused on salespeople the marketing teams or operations but not really for service providers that do business relationships. So I figured there was a gap there in the market. So that's why basically I moved to the States in September, 2020. Um, I did some months of, you know, like discovery interviews and so on. And then December, 2020, I hired my first employee. And uh, well, since then I've been working in this venture and uh, yeah, we launched a few months ago. So we've been on a sort of like public beta with uh, several hundred users. I think we're like at 750 as of today. And uh, now we're in the process of closing our, our first enterprise account. So very exciting times for sure. Thank you for the intro and congrats on your launch and having the users. It must be really exciting for you after all these years of hard work. Yeah, for sure. And especially because, I mean, once you start working in startups. I mean, the life of an employee in in a startup is hard. There's a lot of work, a lot of uncertainty. So at some point, you know, like I know that I work hard, so why not just do it for myself instead of, you know, working for others and uh, basically making others richer, hopefully, you know, um, why not do that for myself? So yeah, I mean, that was also one of the reasons why I decided to make the big jump and to come to the States, you know, the big American dream. Hopefully that's true what they say. But for the moment, it's paying off. Obviously, the uncertainty is still there. But at least I know that I'm building something. And no matter what happens, it's a very nourishing journey for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And you were saying you wanted to do it for yourself. The way that I look at it is, it's not for me. 
It's for my parents. It's to make sure that I can give them a comfortable retirement. And it's to make sure that the team that I work with can become wealthy. Because I don't really care about myself so much. I mean, it's sure what you say. I mean, the only thing is that when uh, when you're working for someone in someone else's startup, obviously all of the uh, work you put in, I have a type of personality that no matter what, I'm going to give the best of myself and try to work as hard as possible. It's true, you know, like if I'm working so hard, hopefully I won't be the only one that has benefited from this. Obviously, if this works, I mean, my parents are also like uh, kind of involved and I would love for them uh, to come out of this, you know, with a happy retirement and uh, to have my employees be able, I don't know, to buy their own house or buy a house partially, who knows? So obviously there's, there are like many other people, right, that, that benefit from this if it works. But I was more in the sense of why work so hard for others when you can benefit people that are closer to you or, or eventually yourself as well. For sure. I get that. You were saying that you, you hope your employees will be able to buy houses while you were saying that, I was thinking, I think anyone in America today would be lucky to be able to get a house. Yeah, the market is quite interesting, to be honest. I mean, right now, like me and my husband, we've been trying, you know, to look for, for flats in New York, hoping, you know, to, uh, to build a family at some point. But um, the market is pretty high at this point so uh yeah we've sort of left that on the side especially because when you're building a such an early stage startup anything can happen so it's important to have some sort of like money or save sort of like cash on the side in case you need it just to make your startup just live like one to two months more so obviously everything around buying a house right now we have left it sort of posted left it on the side until the the company progresses a little bit more because i mean there's a lot of uncertainty you never know what can happen and yeah you, you need a little bit of a cushion right to, to react because for run, run day sorry things can be going well the next day like you know like with COVID, something happens and suddenly your plans change just like massively so it's important you know to have that again like that cushion that extra amount of cash just to be able to push the company a few months more just in case everyone has the same issue so <laughs> i'm pretty sure a lot of people feel identified with this i did that and last year i said i'm done with that i'm not paying for the company anymore so finally i was able to start raising funds and got money from other people and so i'm i'm glad but I mean, what I tell my investors is if we run out of cash and we can't raise more, I'm not putting another dollar in. I'm sorry, I'm walking away. And they're like, okay, I put way too much in. I did it for way too long. The fact that we're raising money and we're seeing traction now is fantastic. I'm really happy for that. But if things change, sorry, I'm out. Sorry, how long did you put your own money? For how long did you do that? Like three and a half years. Three and a half years. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, that, that is a very long time. My goal was to get us past launch so that when we did our first raise, we could have a much higher valuation and I could save equity. I did that and then we were able to get our raise in the eight figures. So, I mean, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, right now, I guess I'm at that, that stage. So we're like, it be in between a pre-seed and a seed on my goal is to be able to read a to raise sorry, a a seed round uh, somewhere in summer so it's true that right now I haven't done like a proper like pre-seed but it's been more like a very extensive safe um, so whenever I feel like I need another cash injection like okay an extra safe either I put the money in or I try to have someone put the money in so this is sort of like how we've been working I mean obviously like ideally I thought that uh, so you know was one of the things that we commented the other day I thought this would have been like a lot faster like a lot quicker you know my initial expectations were that's what this podcast is for we tell people look I thought it was going to cost $125,000 in six months. It cost multiples of that in time and money. <laughs> exactly. I thought it was going to be, I remember when I started again, like December 2020, I'm like, yeah, in five, six months, we're launching a pretty complete MVP. Like the MVP that I had in mind is where we're sort of getting right now, you know, like after one year and two months, whereas I was expecting that in 
just like five to six months, again, with like a third of the money that I ended up investing in uh, in building everything. Because I mean, there's so many things that happen in the way. I think like in the head of a founder, first of all, everything was meant to be done for yesterday. And secondly, I mean, I guess in, in my case, especially because I'm a first time founder, even though I've worked in startups, in my head, it's like, okay, I'm not going to find any roadblocks. Everything is just going to go according to plan. Everything is just going to go fine. And even like two weeks into development, you start finding issues and whenever you think you're about to launch suddenly you start testing the app and everything breaks <laughs> like, everything absolutely breaks so um, even just like the few features that you thought that you were like ready to launch and okay and now i'm gonna start having like thousands of users this is my software you realize like okay this is very far from what i had initially expected and the little that we have is still buggy, like all over the place. Even like when we test internally, we just find bugs all over. So yeah, I think it's very important for anyone that jumps into the entrepreneurial journey, especially when it's like tech related, things take a lot longer than what you expect. Because nothing is as easy as it seems. There are always lots of corner cases that you never think about. And it's always your users, the ones that figure them out. Because you may think like, okay, in my scenario, this is how I would do things. Like I do things like ABC, but maybe there are users that do things in a BAC order. And then suddenly the entire app breaks. <laughs> and stuff for you. Problem in the beginning before you have users, like for myself, being the UI UX designer, I was making, I was writing the feature specifications and designing it designing the workflows like physically and when you start to actually use it after it's been implemented you go actually this is crap mm -hmm. i actually did that as well for the initial year now i finally hired a ux ui and uh, i think like my entire tech team is like finally you know because <laughs> i mean i did that as well you know for the sake of saving money and because uh, it didn't make sense to have someone full time so i did uh, the UX UI role for again, like yeah, a year. So many times again, when the, when I started testing out the flows on the phone or on the desktop version, me myself, like I, I would think like, why the hell did I do this? <laughs> why the hell did I design this in this way? But yeah, I mean, uh, you you can find lots of like situations in that way, and obviously you need to learn how to find call the mistakes, try to solve them, I guess, as long as possible and not stick to your initial idea. Um, so it's important to be able to adapt. I was the product manager and the project manager and the UI UX designer. Like I was a lot of them. And the CEO the and the human res and human resources. And <laughs> well, thankfully I have a COO and he's helped a lot with the human resources side. But I was doing all those other things to the horror of the rest of the team and caused things to get really messed up. We finally had the money to hire a product manager, which was about almost a year ago. And she's completely radically changed how product and project gets managed. And while it's still not perfect, it's leaps and bounds better than anything I could have ever done. So it left me with just like providing the specs and the designs, but I had to go through a process that her and my COO put together, which was far superior to what I was doing. I was originally just saying, okay, here's the specs and here's the designs go. But after she came in, they're like, well, no, like what's your idea? Let's then agree upon this idea as being something we want to do, then provide the specs. Then the development team will pick apart the specs and see if there's anything they could think of that's a problem, add the additional things that might be missing, then go and do the designs, then let them pick apart the designs. If the designs look good, then they get slotted into a sprint at some point and they'll do the development. So that made the team happier because now they know what we're building and we can put the why into it because they feel included in the process Process, they can figure out what problems are going to exist before they start to develop so that it doesn't mess up our sprint planning because we've got story points and all of those things. So her inclusion of the team and taking control of it and me stepping back from product and project was the smartest thing I think we've done so far. But now once we start to get a little bit more money in, which should be relatively soon, we're going to hire a designer so that that person can actually take the designs off my plate. And I can just go, look, this is what I envisioned for the actual design. Go design it. If I think it looks good for me, then send it to the team to pick apart. It makes sense. When I just hired like the UX uh, UI designer, it was such a relief. It's just like everything he was doing just looked so much better, like so much, I don't know, like up to date, you know? 
uh, a lot of the designs that my tech team, they, they tell me they look a little bit like 1990s. <laughs> You're like, yeah, Patty, you need to update your style. So obviously, I mean, it, it's been a game changer. At the same time, I couldn't afford it earlier on. So unfortunately, you need to wait until the product is advanced enough. And it's sort of like, well, I'm not going to say it's strong, but at least you know you have a working MVP, even if it's based on a shitty <laughs> design, but at least have that so that, you know, you can start proving usage. And once you have that role, you can hire proper professional designer until that it's a trial and an error <laughs> pretty much i'm really looking forward to hiring like an accountant because until now i've been the one who manages all of the money pays all of the bills and all of the salaries and takes screenshots for receipts for everything and puts them in folders and does the tax mm. filing like i don't like that stuff i'm doing it because i don't have a choice but like if i could pay someone to do it Especially because like right now we only have 13 people, but with the amount of money we're looking to raise, we're probably going to get close to 80 to a hundred, mm-hmm. like in the oh, next wow. year or so. That's great. Congrats. Imagine paying a hundred people and imagine managing the software uh, licenses for a hundred people. Like I don't want to do that stuff. I've got to deal with product and community and business development and investors and going on podcasts and promoting what we're doing. Like I don't have time to do payroll and all that. So I don't know how you manage any of that stuff, but we are set it set up with wise transfer wise. And we have a business account. And what I've discovered recently is that not only can we get physical cards, but we can also get digital cards so that we could set spending limits for people. So we can assign team members to like, let's say the tech team has a budget and they need like a hundred thousand dollars for the year. We can set it so that they can spend a hundred thousand or divided by 12, you know, that amount per month, something like that. Or if we hire someone who does the accounting, they could start the payment and then they'll go, Hey, we're ready. And I just check it and go, okay, yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. So I can be the one that actually hits send, but they do the prep. Like there's so many tools out there that are so cool for helping you manage stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, right now we're a very small team. So we are eight full times. Then they're like uh, several freelancers. So right now I'm like, you're right. I'm, I'm managing everything. I take care of running the payroll. And the worst thing is that we're sort of like an international company in the sense of my engineers are based in Spain. So it's another legal entity, another different type of filing, different type of, you know, like social security, everything. So we're a Singaporean company and we have no employees in Singapore. We have no physical office in Singapore. All we have is just a lawyer and, and his company does the, the legal stuff, like the corporate secretary, nominee directors. So we use, we have one company and we use TransferWise to pay all of our salaries. Yeah. But I mean, how do you do tax or fiscal sort of, you know, Singapore? Because the thing, the thing is that in Spain, it's a little bit tricky uh in that sense like everything around human resources social security so i mean if you tell an employee a spanish employee that they are hired by a singaporean company and therefore they don't benefit from certain amounts of um, public benefits it's going to be very difficult to hire someone so they need to be under sort of like a spanish legal entity to be to be hired we don't have that problem. I think it's because of the case of like Spain, like Spain, France, and several European countries. They're very picky with those things. We have one guy in Greece and we have one girl in Turkey. Everybody else is in the Southeast Asian region. So what we tell everyone is you're employed by the Singapore company. You get paid cash. Any sort of legal or social things, any sort of health insurance, all of that is on your own. We give you the full amount. And if there's anything like that you file on your own, we don't take any responsibility for that. Because it's impossible. If we're going to grow to, like I said, hundreds of of employees potentially across the entire globe, I'm not going to incorporate in every single country just to manage the social payments for all these people. No. My goal is to pay them enough that they don't care. That's good. That's true. I think it's just like the Spanish ecosystem is very different. Like there's a lot of like public services, you know, like social security, when you compare it, you know, like to the States especially. So when you're hiring engineers, especially, I don't know, like back-end engineers with a lot of, uh, you know, like experience, whatever, either you have like a proper hiring system, a legal entity, or otherwise they're going to tell you to um, to get screwed, basically. <laughs> like, bye-bye, I'll find someone else. And don't worry, like every day I get like 10 offers thrown at my face. So 
if you don't give me this, 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 and this, don't worry. Like I have another 10 companies that I can choose from like today. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's just like the specifications of Spain as a, as a country that makes things a little bit more complicated and uh, therefore means that I need to spend more time. I mean, I have some like call it accountants, you know, like a company that deals with just like running the payroll and filing the taxes in Spain, but still like I need to make the payments, the communications. So it's a lot of time that I spend a month, even if I don't file myself, but just managing it. So yeah, eventually, you know, I would love to be in your situation, hopefully not too far from now where I can hire someone to just take care of that and I can say bye. (laughs) If you know that Spain is such a hassle, why do you engage that? Uh, Well, I'm Spanish originally, so it was easier to find very good talent. Well, because I'm Spanish, I worked in a few like European startups. It was easier to find people. And something that I want to make sure that I do, you know, within the company is to build a team ecosystem. So the good thing is that they're all based in Madrid. So once a week, they go to the office, they mingle together. So that's one of the things that just like culturally, I want to enhance, you know, make sure that there is this feeling of belonging to a team, to a common project. And um helps a little bit with with the connection in terms of like things that you talk about that are like not work related you know it's easier we speak in Spanish initially I wanted to do it in the U.S. and I actually started like speaking to potential engineers in the states until I saw like okay for a senior back an engineer like someone who writes in Python I need to be paying like 300k for someone who has 10 plus years experience and I'm like you know what, <laughs> let me reconsider. <laughs> so that's why, you know, I decided to go to Spain. In Asia, you can get that for like 50, 60K. I mean, Spain is a little bit more expensive, I would say. It's more like on the 70s. But again, like it's not 300, right? I mean, it's day and night. So that's why I decided like, okay, you know what, even though it's a little bit more of a pain in the ass setting all of the legal entity and running a different payroll or whatever, I'm going to have, you know, more ease in finding people and again, like creating that team that I want to create because I didn't want to have like people a little bit like spread out all over. You also have an American company, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the American holding and then the Spanish subsidiary. So all of your revenue should go through the American company yeah. and then Spain is just for paying salaries. Otherwise you're going to get screwed on income tax in Spain. We have this sort of like intercompany agreement. Every month what happens is that Spain has to um, invoice the American company for the development of software services. So at least, you know, the American company has a cost base as well. Otherwise, I'm just going to have like a bunch of revenue in New York that makes no sense. We explored something like that when we were thinking of doing a token sale because Singapore isn't allowed to do the token sale. So we have to like set up in another country. I won't name that country here. <laughs> set up in another country that specifically handles the token sale. And then because the, the money goes there, but Singapore is the one that manages the operations, it would need to invoice that other entity to get the money to pay the salaries. So totally the same thing. And did you know like this beforehand or was it something like you just stumbled upon? Like, oh shit. (laughs) It's something my lawyer told me when we were planning the structure, but we were not doing the token sale now. So I have the knowledge, but not the structure. Well, at least you, you know beforehand. That is not something that you just try doing and suddenly you found yourself like in the situation of, oh damn, (laughs) I cannot sell my product. There's another hack you may or may not be aware of that I've recently learned. Basically, so as an American, right, if we have equity and you're, you're probably already a tax resident of the United States, so this will probably apply to you. When you have equity and you do a raise and the value of that company is worth uh, goes up, there's technically a capital gains tax on that unrealized gain. Yeah. And when you go to sell it, there's definitely a tax on that gain. For sure. So instead of holding the shares personally, you should form a holding company and the holding company will hold those shares and receive the salary, pay the business expenses for your personal life, whatever, and then give you a smaller salary. So this lowers your tax burden in the United States as a tax resident. Yeah, that's something that I've been thinking. And when you go to exit the company, or if you even if you sell any percentage of your shares, even if you're still involved in the company, the burden doesn't hit you, it hits your company. So if you register that company outside of America in a country like Estonia, which doesn't have a income tax for companies, it has a profit and dividend tax. 
So as long as you never declare a profit, you literally don't have to pay tax in Estonia. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, tax engineering. <laughs> no, but that's something I was thinking about. This is something that you should be doing as soon as we finish this recording. <laughs> because you've already raised money. Yeah, I'm going to call my lawyer like, uh, hey. <laughs> it's very simple. All you have to do is make yourself the employee of a holding company that then holds the shares and receives the salary. Yeah, and that's and that's it, just a simple. It'll save you in Spain and it'll save you in America. I'm pretty sure it's very common. It's only common if you think about it. A lot of people don't think about it or they think about it and it's kind of late. Late, yeah. That was sort of like my fear. Like, I know I need to do something about it. But, um, you know, like my head every day is just like all over the place. And I'm always like, okay, I mean, I need to sit down and think about this. Like if this works in the long term, I need to make sure that I'm a little bit protected. Especially because you're living in America. Mm -hmm. As an American citizen, I'm screwed no matter where I choose to live. But by living outside of the U.S. more than six months a year and being an employee of a foreign entity, I have what's called foreign income exclusion. So the first $110,000 that I earn each year, I literally pay zero to the American government legally. I have to file, but I pay zero. But you, so you're six months a year, you're outside the States? Usually like 10 months out of the year, I'm out of the States. Oh, really? Like, well, you go to Singapore or just like travel? Well, I was living in Vietnam for multiple years. I was in China for years before that. I'm moving to Portugal now, so I'll be living in Europe. That's cool. Wow. I'll actually be in Valencia in a few months. I've got some friends in Valencia. I've been to Barcelona. I've been to Madrid. I've been to Cádiz. I want to go to Sevilla. You have to go to Sevilla, but you need to make sure you go during uh, La Feria. When is that, May? And it's in April. It's when, you know, when people dress up like flamenco people with the typical dresses and they go on top of horses and i love flamenco it's like my favorite music yeah i mean you have to go during la feria it's it's so much fun well i don't know what my schedule is just yet but i was planning on going to greece and then to croatia and then to slovenia and then maybe to spain and from spain to portugal because i have to wait for the portuguese government to like fingerprint me to do the residence permit yeah once they give me the entry visa then I may wait a few months until they're ready to do the fingerprinting. So I'm basically going to just travel around until they're ready and then come back. That's a good plan. Like an international CEO. <laughs> Well, I mean, that was my goal when I started this company was I don't ever want to have an office. I want to be where I want to be and I want my team to be where they want to be. And as long as we all have that, it's a good foundation of trust. And like you said, you, you want your team to feel like part of a family and I want that too. I think we just think about it differently because I hate offices and, you know, if I want to like work on the beach, then I want to work on the beach. I don't want anyone to be like, oh, you need to get back to the office. Like, nope, sorry. And none of your employees have ever felt any times, you know, of, uh, I don't want to say like, uh, you know, like anxiety, but you know, like there is a lot of like mental health topics going on right now about, you know, like employees feeling like very lonely because they're like at their homes and uh, I don't know, they, they don't see any other like uh, colleagues during the day. Again, I mean, it all depends obviously on how you manage your own life, right? This is like a very personal decision. I feel anxiety. I think everybody feels anxiety. And I think working from home probably doesn't help. It helps in some ways where you feel less stressed about the work you do when you're focused. But a lot of them that we hire are married and some of them have kids. So if they're at home all day with their spouse and their kids, chances are they feel less lonely on uh, an individual basis. On a company-wide basis, I'm trying right now to figure out every way that we can to make people feel more engaged. And part of the product that we're building is for engagement and gamification of work. It's like it's a team collaboration. Exactly. So we're trying to figure out how we can get people who are working remotely to feel engaged and desire to do their work in an efficient manner and how to reward them for that. Obviously, it's a, you know going to require years of study and research and development and all of that going from here, from the original, from the first thing that we launched. But, um, but it is very important. And by being a fully remote team, it puts us in a position where we're building for ourselves. So we, yeah. we have a sense of what needs to be done. Like, for example, because we're going to be building an AR and VR in the future – you know, I've got a VR headset, my CTO has a VR headset, and I've discovered an application called Altspace VR, which not only has a desktop app, but a VR app. And so I've kind of forced the team to download it, even if they don't have a VR headset, download the desktop app, and we're going to get together in a world and just have a happy hour. We've never done it before. And so I just want everyone to just get together and chill. Have you tried it out already? 
I use the app once or twice a week. I talk to strangers all over the world. It's a ton of fun. So I created a private world and I've whitelisted all of the team members so that no strangers can come into this place. Okay. So I want us to be able to meet in VR. Like I've wanted us to meet in person, but obviously that's not possible right now. I've actually only ever met one of the team members and that's my COO who I've been close friends with for 22 years. I've never met any of the other people. I would love to meet them, but at least right now, VR is the best I can do. Each of you have your own uh, avatars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I find that world like so cool, but at the same time, so frightening. I don't know why. I need to get my head around it. You need to get your own headset and get your head in it. <laughs> I mean, I've tried some VR experiences, but more like attraction type of thing like a roller coaster that makes you want to vomit i <laughs> know but uh as in like there's this van gogh experience in the, in new york and one of the areas is like okay there's like a vr experience you put the headset and you're like walking around van gogh's house and the suburbs of his city and where he got inspired so you're like having a walk around i mean which was pretty cool then i need to go from like okay this was a fun sort of like a 20 minute game to like okay this is gonna be part of our lives that's where i am where <laughs> i have a meta quest too there are good things about it there's bad things about it the bad things about it is that it's a little too heavy, so it can hurt your head and your neck mm. if you wear it too long. The battery dies after an hour and a half to two hours, maybe two and a half if you're lucky. So I don't like that. There's also an AR pass-through, meaning you can do AR applications, but because it's on a grayscale, it's not a very good experience. The good things about it are that it's quite versatile and the experience is really fun. So for example... I have a table tennis game, a boxing game, a mini golf game, and uh, like Alt Space VR. So I will play this thing every day until the battery's dead. So I'll, I'll play it for an hour, hour and a half, two hours a day because it's my fitness. I can't go to the gym. So I've got to burn calories and like using the boxing within 15 minutes of fighting, I'm sweating, really sweating, really bad in a good way. Oh, it's fantastic. It's really cool. Like you have to actually move around and duck and like, you know, punch for the face and punch for the chest and, and the stomach. And like there's different reactions for the people. And it's really a positive experience. And like VR has a lot of potential. To bring people together, to bring teams together. If you have a team that is spread all over the world, then, you know, like basically the office as a concept, it disappears, you know, from our daily work lives. I mean, it's sure that VR, it's a very good substitute to ensure that people are engaged. I think AR is really solid for productivity. A VR is very solid for company culture and engagement. And I think offices are dead for multiple reasons. One, they're expensive. I'll give you an example. I interviewed a guy from Canada. He has a company with like 150 employees. They rent a warehouse in Canada, $80,000 a month. Because of the pandemic, he was able to save his company a million dollars a year. Not to mention, if you don't have an office, there's no electricity and there's no equipment costs. Exactly. So if I had to choose between putting a million dollars in the pockets of my investors or spending it on an office that I'm forced to go into, I'll give them the money every day of the year. Here, like I tried the office concept for a bit in New York, but the reality is that a lot of days I would stay at home. Because I mean, you have these days where you're like on call after call after call after call. So you need to get out of your mini office space anyway. And like if you're in a WeWork, you end up in the phone booth. So why the hell would you want to be inside a WeWork phone booth for the entire freaking day? <laughs> right? So Exactly. When I do these calls, I try to go on walks. Although like when, when we're doing these kinds of recordings and I need to be tethered and I have got the uh, microphone and all that, it's different, but I wouldn't want to be in an office or in a, in a, a phone booth. <laughs> Not worth it at all. <laughs> Especially if it's just like this uh, one times one meter, square meter, meter space, which is just like, it's horrible. I mean, it's good to find that sort of like balance, especially if you're like in the same city, obviously your, your case is very different. But if you're like in the same city, try to meet up, you know, try to see someone face to face from time to time. Like, I think it really helps just maintain happiness amongst the workforce, I would say. You know, the first stop in Europe, I'm going to Athens. Why? My team member is there. I'm going to spend like a few weeks with him. I've never met him. He's the marketing director. He's the, the lead, you know, for the department. He's a very important person. And I don't know much about him other than, to, you know, typing with him and like a few phone calls here and there. I have never seen my marketing director either. He, he is a part-time, but he lives in Miami, I mean, which is not very far away, but I haven't just been there just 
because of it. But uh, yeah, I've never seen him either. And I'm like, okay, next time, whenever I find a moment to fly to Miami, we, we just have to meet and just to see each other, you know, like, I'm curious to know how tall you are. <laughs> Especially because it's fun whenever you see like people in person, then some of you are like, oh my God, you're like a lot taller than I expected or a lot shorter. You thought someone was like big and humongous and suddenly they show up and they're like super tiny. At the end of the day, like through the camera, you only see like my face and a little bit of my upper body. So it's interesting when you see people for the first time, like in real life, how you find out you were so wrong about how many hypotheses, about so many hypotheses around a specific person but yeah i mean other than that as i was as you were saying i totally agree that the office space as we knew it it's pretty much that it's just like it's an amount of money that you waste that just makes no sense especially now like every employee when there's like a lot of rotation they end up buying their own sort of like big screens and their own sort of like especially engineers they all they each of them have their own like keyboard that they like and has like multiple colors and the cool uh, mouse or whatever so the only thing, if any, you need to give them the laptop because the rest of the set, they already have it. So you save a lot on buying extra screens and extra keyboards and, uh, you know, the desk, the chair, and all of that is sort of like, okay, covered. Here's an example. We were just mentioning, you know, cost savings. And I said, if I had a million, I'd rather give it to investors. But actually what I plan on doing once we do our next raise is telling the whole team, look, if there's anything that you need to upgrade you've got $1,500, give us the receipts and we'll pay you with your salary. Because for example, we have one designer and he's amazing. And he's like, I want to get into 3D, but I need to upgrade my computer and it's going to cost me 1500. And I was like, great. That's how much I was thinking of giving everyone stipends, but like, we're just not there yet. So just figure out how exactly how much it's going to cost to get your stuff prepared. And if you buy it now, like go for it. And then once we're ready, we can pay you back. Just like keep the receipts. I really want to do a lot for the team, especially because we can't do things like health insurance or anything like that. So for me, the top most important things that I can do for the team are tech upgrades, maybe a psychologist that's in-house full-time and emergency medical costs. Like if, if you break your leg and you have to go to the hospital and it's a thousand bucks, okay, here's the thousand bucks. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it ends up being more worth it than finding some sort of like structure to pay health insurance to all of them. It's just like, if the event happens, I'll just pay. I mean, <laughs> all we have to do is set aside a thousand dollars for each person for the year and just don't really tell them about it because otherwise you may have to deal with them trying to get it, even if they don't need it. <laughs> yeah, I just fell down the stairs. My, my ankle hurts. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, there's this company called Humble Bundle. I don't know if you heard of them. Uh, nope. They do packages of software or books or things like that. Everything digital usually at a deep discount. So for example, I was like, hey, do you guys want to learn about you know machine learning? Sure. It's like 15 bucks and there's like 10 books that they get. All right, go learn machine learning and figure out how this can be useful for. I want to do a lot of those kinds of things or like, let's do a, a fitness challenge and whoever can maintain this level of fitness or who can lose X amount of weight, whatever, gets a free Oculus, you know, quest too. That, that's a pretty cool one. Like doing a quest and just buying something like, I mean, the Oculus, what's the price of the Oculus quest? The 128 gig is 299. But I thought it was more expensive. No, but... Meta is coming out with something, it's called Project Cambria. It's meant to be a high-end VR headset with a full-color pass-through for the AR. And they may be coming out with it this year, and I expect the price point to be 800 to 1000 Maybe 1200 probably not more than it, probably like 999 But I'm going to buy that just because... The Quest 2 is great. I know. I mean, and that's your your world. I mean, that's where you're working in. So you want to be on top of the latest uh, development. For me, it doesn't make that much sense, but uh, I can start with a cheaper one. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, the Quest 2 is more than good enough for most people's needs. Absolutely. How can people follow up with you? So, um, well, check out our website, obviously, kaironetworks.com. Um, so that you can see what we're building. If you want to, you know, like upgrade your networking and relationship management game, feel free to check us out. Otherwise, please send me an email to patricia at caronetworks.com. I'm happy, you know, to exchange ideas around like B2B SaaS or stages, networking and relationship management tools. But yeah, open to speak to anyone. All right, great. Thank you for your time and your energy. I really appreciated it. If you like this episode, definitely follow up with her. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. Thank you, Patty. Bye. Thank you. 